a co-production of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service National Conservation Training Center and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Distribution funding provided by the Phillips Petroleum Company. Hey, Rick, check it out. A thousand bucks. Sounds cool. Oh, except I always have to take care of my little sister after school. So? Bring her along. Let's get Maria to help, too. The living things of our planet. Species after species evolving since life on Earth began more than three and a half billion years ago. But now their habitat is being destroyed and biodiversity threatened. I like the music. Yeah. Hey, can you guys turn that up a little bit? That's pretty. Oh, I like that panther. Mm -hmm. We humans are now making species go extinct at a very rapid rate. If we don't take action soon, the only place these creatures will be able to live may be here, in a zoo. Okay, now we're cruising. Yeah, but guys, it's only one minute. Didn't the contest say it had to be an hour? What do you want to put in now? Let's go over the rules again. Environmental film and video contest open to middle and high school students working as partners. Must educate people to the importance of a healthy environment. Hey, don't forget the prize. A thousand bucks. Split three ways. Okay, our topic is biodiversity, the variety of life. From elephants to ants, redwood trees to buttercups. Pythons to people. Diversity is also the different kinds of ecosystem that life depends on, like deserts, coral reefs, rainforests. Mountains, rivers, lakes. What's all this? My uncle's a wildlife filmmaker. He films species that are having trouble surviving, like this one. The big-eared bat of Virginia. The peregrine falcon returns to New York City. And the hairy-nosed wombat of Australia. Hairy-nosed wombat? Man, that's one animal I don't want to run into. <laughs> so all these are endangered? No, but some of them are endangered or threatened. What's the difference? An endangered species is one in danger of becoming extinct throughout all or significant portion of its range, like these. The whooping crane and the black-footed ferret. A threatened species is likely to become endangered in the near future, like the African elephant or the green sea turtle. A federal agency called the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service identifies and puts endangered and threatened species on a special list. Eagles. Let's start with them. I mean, think of it. The bald eagle might have gone extinct, and it's our national symbol. When the bald eagle was adopted as our national symbol in 1782, there were an estimated 25,000 to 75,000 of them nesting in the lower 48 states. In 1967, they were officially declared an endangered species. The greatest threat to their survival was an environmental contaminant DDT. This pesticide, which was sprayed on farm crops and used to eradicate mosquitoes in public places such as pools, washed into lakes and streams. Contaminated fish were eaten by many kinds of birds, and some had problems with reproduction. The DDT weakened their eggshells, and so they often broke before hatching. In 1972, the government banned the use of DDT in the United States, and bald eagles began their comeback. Some were taken into captivity for breeding, while natural nesting sites like this one were protected. Here in Kansas, biologists are going to great heights to measure and tag young eagles, which have black feathers until they reach maturity. trip back up the tree is always a bit awkward. By the mid-1990s, 4,500 nesting pairs lived in the wild, so their status was changed from endangered to threatened. With continuing help, bald eagles are on their way to recovery. Wait a minute, 
I just had a horrible thought. People eat fish too, and some contaminants can stay in the environment for a long time. I wonder if GDT is still affecting us. That's nasty. I'm gonna check it out. Hey, Rick, speaking of nasty, these sneakers of yours aren't environmental contaminants. <laughs> Stop! Stop! Stop. Alright, wait a minute. Here's one on mayonnaise. <laughs> Cut it out. Manatees, which can weigh up to 1,300 pounds, have been described as huge potatoes with flippers. Their habitat is the warm water bays from Florida to Brazil. Outside of the U.S., manatees are often killed for their meat. Aerial studies show about 2,600 of these endangered marine mammals living in Florida waters. Because they float just below the water surface, manatees are vulnerable to reckless speedboats whose propellers and keel slash the creature's tough hide. Impact from boats is a leading cause of death. In fact, propeller scars are the main way biologists tell manatees apart. There's a manatee out here that's swimming. Near Fort Myers, Florida, an environmental seminar of teenagers called the Monday Group put up signs to warn boaters to slow down in manatee habitat and they did more. It turns out that right here, the warm discharge from the canal or from the power plant uh, attracts manatees. And this is one of the best places in North America to view manatees. Aside from coming here, people may never ever in their entire life get a chance to see a manatee. But there are plans to fence the area off, so the Monday group went into action. We went to the county commission and we lobbied in favor of somehow keeping this open. We uh, need to get all the trash that people have been dumping over the years out of here. We uh, talked repeatedly to county attorneys and commissioners and everybody else and they agreed. Eventually, once they found out that they weren't really going to have to do that much work and it took a lot of convincing, they did agree to put a park up. I don't know, guys. Manatees are cool and all, but I just think we should start off with an animal that have four legs and furry, like these guys. All right. Black-footed ferrets, once considered the most endangered mammals in the U.S., live mostly underground. Because they're predators, they depend on other animals to live. In this case, prairie dogs. Black-footed ferrets move into prairie dog dens and eat their hosts bones, fur, and all. Everything except the paws. It used to be that where they were prairie dogs, they were black-footed ferrets. But when people settled the prairies throughout the Great Plains, prairie dogs had to compete with livestock for food. There were attempts to eliminate these so-called pest rodents by poisoning and trapping. Without the prairie dog, black-footed ferrets had no food and their numbers seriously declined. There were no sightings for nine years, so many people thought they were extinct. Then, in 1981, this rancher in Wyoming found a strange animal killed by a dog. A taxidermist recognized it as a black-footed ferret and a small local population was discovered. In the late 1980s, 18 black-footed ferrets the last known to exist in the wild, were captured for breeding. Now there are more than 500 ferrets in captivity, living in artificial dens built like prairie dog towns.
Before introducing the animals to the wild, biologists are placing them in these halfway houses. The ferrets are then released into prairie dog habitat in various states, such as South Dakota. Wait a minute. Why don't we do something beautiful instead, like a bird or a plant? A, a plant? plant? Yeah. Plants are boring. We can't live without plants. Listen to this. Aspirin came from the bark of a willow tree, and penicillin came from a fungus. A treatment for cancer was found in the bark of a Pacific yew tree. For thousands of years, Native Americans used the Pacific yew to combat skin cancer and bronchitis. In the late 1960s, researchers discovered that the bark of the tree contained a substance that could be made into a drug called Taxol. But removing the bark can kill the yew, so scientists came up with a way to make Taxol out of the needles and twigs, the renewable parts of the tree. Taxol is one of the most promising new compounds in the fight against ovarian cancer. Doctors are also using this drug to treat breast cancer in patients like Mary Chapman. I have two twin girls, April and Jill. They were two years old when I was diagnosed. And Taxol has given me a new lease on life. It has enabled me to spend time with my children, continue to work. I'm just glad that it was there. Nose to nose, huh? I like that one. I know a girl from my school who got leukemia. She says she's alive because of a medicine from a plant called the rosy periwinkle. Hey, why don't you get her to be in our video? It shows how saving species can mean saving ourselves. OK, I'll try. <laughs> Listen to this. Only a fraction of all the plants in the world have been studied. Many of them don't even have names yet. If we don't protect their habitat, we might lose treatments for lots of diseases, not just leukemia. Plants give us other useful stuff besides just medicines, right? Mm -hmm. Like dyes and paints. And our food. I couldn't live without plants. You know I'm a vegetarian. Well, I could. I'm a hamburger man myself. Cows didn't have grass to eat. You wouldn't be getting your double cheeseburgers every day now, would you? True, true. Plants don't just help us, either. Insects and birds depend on flowers for their nectar. Besides, flowers are beautiful, and there aren't enough beautiful things in the world. You're right. Plants are important, but let's not put them first. I personally think the ferret should go No, I think the ferret should go first. Wait a minute. How about this? Let's work together for the beginning and the end of the video, and then we can do our own thing for the middle. That's cool. Fine with me. OK, our topic is biodiversity. And that isn't just endangered species. There are plenty of animals and plants that aren't endangered. My uncle says the best and cheapest time to save a species is when there's still a lot of them. We still need a strong title that really says what's happening. Like, stop ruining our world. Nah, it's too negative. People tune out if they get depressed. Yeah. How about fins, fangs, feathers, and fleas? Or frogs, hogs, and dogs. Or grasses, basses, and... <laughs> Stop right there. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm serious now. We're saying how diversity is important in nature, right? And look at us. We're diversity. The variety of human life. That's biodiversity too, right? Why don't we call our video Biodiversity? Wild about life. Okay, I yeah, like it. Great. Can we use your studio? Sure. You know where the key is. Let's go for it. The whooping crane is one of the world's rarest birds. 
No more than 1,400 are known to have lived in all of North America. By 1942, there were only 22 left. Most belonged to a migratory flock that traveled more than 2,000 miles from Canada in the summer to the Texas Gulf Coast in winter. They faced many obstacles on their long journey, such as violent storms and power lines. But the greatest threat to their survival has been the loss of their habitat. sent me to look for him. No, I haven't seen him. Are you going to be a dancer? I'm working on it. What do you want to be? A veterinarian. That's why I read so much about animals. Whooping cranes. Is that what you're doing? I'm doing birds that migrate over thousands of miles. Like the whooping crane. I was just watching some footage. Sit down. OK. At five feet tall and with a wingspan of seven feet, the whooping crane flies with slow wing beats and neck and legs extended. Its beak is so strong it can open a tin can. The bird gets its name from its trumpeting cries. Whooping cranes nest in marshes where they can find insects, frogs, and berries to eat. These slow-moving birds need wide open spaces so they can see the approach of predators like the bobcat. As they travel between their breeding and wintering grounds, they need to stop over in wetlands. More than 500 national wildlife refuges in the U.S. cover about 100 million acres, the largest network of land and water in the world dedicated to wildlife conservation. The whole system, which is managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, was started in 1903 by President Theodore Roosevelt. At the time, feathered hats were the style. Roosevelt wanted to give herons and egrets a refuge where they couldn't be slaughtered for their feathers. National wildlife refuges are vital to migratory birds because so many wetlands and grasslands have been taken over by farms and towns. Wetlands used to be considered wastelands and they were often drained to get rid of mosquitoes. Scientists estimate that the U.S. is losing more than 800 acres of wetlands per day. More recently, Wetlands have become recognized as important to humans as well as to birds. They provide a dependable water supply, filter out pollutants, and serve as a natural means of flood and erosion control. If whooping cranes could be taught a safe route for migrating and finding wetland habitat along the way, many more would survive. But how can you teach a crane where to fly? Sandhill cranes are part of just such an experiment. The chicks were conditioned to follow a pilot in his ultralight airplane. When they were old enough to migrate, they took off after the plane, just as they normally would their mother. The cranes can fly up to 40 miles per hour. They glide much of the way, surfing the wind behind the plane's wings. In 1995, 11 birds started the 750-mile trip from Idaho to New Mexico. Only four survived the flight and winter. In the spring, they found their own way back to Idaho, and the next fall, the ultralight guided eight birds all the way to New Mexico. After this success, Scientists were ready to teach this method to endangered migratory birds, like the whoopers. 
That was cool, Maria. I'd love to try it in an ultralight. <laughs> Maybe you'll get to someday. Okay, on this part, I'm going to read the narration I wrote to go along with the video. So tell me what you think. Wildlife biologists at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Laurel, Maryland, are making sure whooping crane populations don't drop too low. Recovery efforts started in 1967 when the whooping crane was listed as endangered and captive breeding was begun. The bird typically lays two eggs but will raise only one chick. Scientists take the extra egg and incubate it at one of the three captive breeding sites in the U.S. Biologists also help whooping cranes reproduce by artificially inseminating them. Scientists take special care that chicks in captivity don't realize they are being raised by humans. People put on ghost costumes, which are just sheets over their bodies and hoods over their heads to hide their human forms, and use a crane-like puppet to feed the chicks. The people never speak around the newborns. The goal is to have them imprint or identify with their own kind. Otherwise, the chicks might grow up thinking they're humans. Even with all of these efforts, only about 300 whooping cranes still live in the world. With continuing research, captive breeding, and habitat protection, there could be 1,000 by the year 2020. Only then could the species be upgraded from endangered to threatened. Bravo. Thank you. That was great, because, you know, I didn't know anything about whooping cranes. And I bet most people don't. They're probably one of the biggest birds alive. Well, next comes one of the smallest, the hummingbird. Can you believe something this tiny migrates over thousands of miles? Oh, hummingbirds are awesome. We used to have a red plastic bird feeder in our backyard when we lived in Maine. The hummingbirds flew right up to it, and you can see their wings going a <laughs> mile a minute. <laughs> Actually, it's about 80 times a second. Hummingbird populations appear to be healthy, helped by the many thousands of people who put up feeders. These amazing birds spend one-third of the year in the U.S. and Canada, and two-thirds in Central America. Of more than 700 kinds of birds in North America, about 350 are neotropical migrants, which means they make these long journeys each spring and fall. Hummingbirds are one of nature's marvels. The ruby-throated variety, which is native to the eastern half of the U.S., weighs just three to four grams, about as much as a ballpoint pen. As pollinators, hummingbirds are important to the seed production of many tube-shaped flowers. The flowers help to nourish the hummingbirds, who could not stay healthy on a diet of just sugar water from feeders. Hummingbirds fly between temperate and tropical climate zones. Prior to their migrations, the ruby throats eat heavily, just like a runner loading up on carbohydrates the night before a marathon. As the hummingbirds head south over the U.S., they can land to rest or eat more food. But going across the 500-mile Gulf of Mexico, there's no stopping and no turning back. Scientists estimate ruby throats can store food for a maximum of 600 miles. If they run into a strong headwind, they may tire out and fall to the water. The tremendous land area of the temperate United States and Canada provides the plants for more than a dozen species of hummingbirds to raise their offspring. But during winter, all neotropical migrants must funnel into a small geographical area in the tropics. The loss of even a few acres of rainforest habitat can wipe out a whole wintering area. Also, environmental contaminants like DDT are still used in other countries. To help migrant birds in both their summer and winter sites, State and federal wildlife agencies, as well as conservation groups and industry, have banded together into Partners in Flight, 
This group works to conserve habitats, encourage basic research, and educate the public. Did anybody ever have a bird crash into their window and you found it dead outside? Sometimes they don't see the window at all. It's just clear and they think they could fly through. So one thing you can do is you can make a special cutout like this that looks like a hawk. And you paste that up in your window and they think it's a hawk flying at them and they fly the other way and they don't crash into your window. Each year on the second Saturday in May, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, a private conservation group, sponsors International Migratory Bird Day to welcome migratory birds back to North America. The bluebird is a migratory bird that is losing its natural nesting places in dead trees, so people are building them special boxes. They're also having problems because it's Now the next thing is to put on the roof. Barns are all going. People don't like the way their garage is open and have this the bluebird builds its nest in here, and then after the babies get old enough, they come out through the hole, somewhere between about 14 and 21 days old, and they never come back except to start another nest. People should never disturb a bluebird box in the field unless they are part of a bluebird monitoring program, such as the one going on here. I wonder when they'll be ready to fly. I'm doing a video on how wolves are important to the ecosystem. Any good stories out there? Slam dunk. You must be a city kid. Why would you care about wolves? They're killers. Have you ever seen a calf get torn up by a wolf? Restless. Slam dunk. Restless is only telling you part of the story. Wolves mostly go after deer or other wild animals. They actually help a species stay healthy by killing off the old or the weak ones. If you want to see gray wolves up close, come up to Minnesota. We have about 2,000 of them. Wolves are threatened here, but not endangered like in most states. I'm not saying that wolves don't get killed sometimes, but most people have learned to accept them. Shadow. Shadow, I need some good video of gray wolves. Can you help me out? No problem. I volunteered with the wolf fund up here, and I know they made a great video. I'll send it to you. All right, this is just what I need. Slam Dunk, why don't you do a story on grizzly bears? There are only about 600 left in the US outside of Alaska. Their territory is getting all cut up by roads and development. When we camped at Yellowstone last summer, I saw a whole family of grizzlies. How big are they? The biggest grizzly ever caught outside Alaska weighed 1,100 pounds. Didn't he attack you? <laughs> we kept our food and garbage packed up, so the bears kept their distance. But they eat mostly plants, fish, and insects, and some meat from animals that are already dead. Do they eat people? Only 20 humans have been killed by grizzlies in something like 95 years. And that's mostly when people get between the mother and her cubs, or the bears are dangerous from people feeding them. Thanks for the info. At seven feet tall, male grizzlies can look extremely menacing when they stand upright. But usually they are just surveying their surroundings. These bears generally avoid contact with humans and run away at the sight or sound of them. But conflicts do occur when any bears, like these black bears, come near people, lured by garbage, pet food, and livestock carcasses, what biologists call attractants. Human bear conflicts have decreased lately because trash dumps have been closed and the public has been educated on how to avoid attracting bears in campgrounds.
The largest problem for grizzlies has been habitat fragmentation, which is the breakup and loss of all but 2% of their original range to human settlement, agriculture, logging, and mining. Bears need a very large and diverse territory to roam in, up to 500 square miles of forests, grasslands, and mountains. In Alaska, they have this open space, which is why there is a healthy population of about 30,000. Here, there is room to roam and food for the taking. Grizzlies reproduce very slowly. Females give birth to two cubs every three years, and only half of them survive to breeding age. The future of these bears in the lower 48 states depends on special recovery zones where their populations can be monitored. Many people living near bear habitat realize that what's good for these large animals, open space, few roads, less development, can also enhance the quality of human life. Where's a 22? I've got it. I'll do bears and wolves. They're both predators, and people give them both a bad rap. Shadow came through. My man. Wolves once roamed all across North America, but their prime food source, bison, deer, elk, and moose, were depleted by early settlers. With little alternative, the wolf turned to the sheep and cattle that people brought to the plains. In 1914, the U.S. Congress approved funds for destroying wolves, prairie dogs, and other animals injurious to agriculture and animal husbandry. Wolves were hunted with more passion than any other animal in American history and have been exterminated from 99% of their former range in the U.S. To help wolves recover, scientists need to know more about their physiology, mortality, productivity, and prey. But these shy and elusive creatures are often extremely hard to find. So biologists have devised a way to capture them attach radio collars and follow them by aerial tracking. Each collar emits its own frequency, kind of like transmitting on a different radio station. This plane has an antenna on each wing. By turning the plane toward the wing receiving the strongest signal, scientists can home in on a particular wolf. Wolf 313 is female. They weigh her, she's 85 pounds, and wrap her in a space blanket to keep her warm. Then they take a blood sample to check her health and hormone levels. Many people believe that wolves are dangerous to humans and kill for fun, but that's not true. The wolf is a top predator, which means that while it preys on many other animals, no animal regularly preys on it except humans. Top predators help to keep a balance in an ecosystem by eliminating many smaller animals that would otherwise overpopulate an area. I heard about wolves coming back to Yellowstone National Park. Anybody know about that? I live near Yellowstone, so I know all about the wolf reintroduction there. There haven't been wolves in the park for 70 years, and a lot of people didn't want them back. So what happened? My dad's a farmer, so he went to all the meetings. He was worried that the wolves would attack our livestock, but after he heard what the biologist said, he was willing to give them a try. So where are you? You know of any good video? Yeah, it was all over the news. 14 gray wolves were brought down from Canada.
Until 8.30 a.m., January 12, 1995, the wolf was the only species missing from the Yellowstone ecosystem. Now, Canis lupus has returned to Yellowstone National Park. The wolves spend their first days here in pens getting used to the area. Then they are released into the wild. Apparently, the wolves are fulfilling their role as predators by feeding on elk and bison. Scientists studying the carcasses have found that many of the dead animals had worn down teeth and arthritis, signs that they were aged and vulnerable. Of the first 14 wolves released, some have died. But come spring, one female gave birth to eight pups and a number of healthy packs are forming. Wolves have proven to be a popular draw for tourists at Yellowstone. Conservation groups have established funds to pay ranchers if any wolves leave the park and kill their animals. A year after the first reintroduction, 37 more wolves were released at Yellowstone, as well as into federal wilderness in Idaho. So now there's hope the gray wolf may recover to the point where the species can be removed from the endangered list. People who exterminated the gray wolf here in the first place are now responsible for bringing them back. My father says that wilderness isn't really wild unless there are wolves roaming around. I've heard the wolves call in the night, and I know what he means. Uh, Ow! You gotta be more careful. This thing still hurts. I barely touched you. God. What's your problem today? I thought you liked taking me fishing. Fishing here is a waste. The water's so polluted that if we ever caught anything, we'd have to throw it back. And look, look at all the trash. People don't care. That's why you're doing this video, to get people to care. Yeah, the video. That's what I should be working on. Just gotta figure out what species to do. Why don't you do your section on something small? I read about these kids once in Minnesota who found a pond full of frogs with two heads and three legs. Sounds cool. Cool? If people around here started having babies with two heads, you'd probably say there was something pretty scary going on, wouldn't you? Yeah, I guess so. Hey, how about lizards? What? I heard about the... <laughs> like I'm really gonna start a crusade to save the lizards. <laughs> you can't just let species die off because you don't think they matter. They could be really important. You know, it's like the world is this big jigsaw puzzle, like the one at Maria's. The puzzle isn't complete unless you have all the plants, birds, insects, fish. And people. Yeah, sure, people. We breathe the same air as animals. We drink the same water the fish swim in. Not that water. I wouldn't drink from there for a million bucks. But fish and ducks and birds don't have any choice. And if we eat them, then we're eating what they eat. Yeah. So when we protect the wildlife, we're actually protecting ourselves. Nah, but even if we could clean up this river, the fish and birds wouldn't necessarily be safe. You know, because some of them migrate south for the winter. So that would mean the people would have to protect the habitat at both ends and all along the way. What a great story. Come on, let's get over to Maria's and see if she has any videotapes I can use. Here's one of the striped bass. Didn't know they were in trouble. The striped bass was never officially declared endangered. But in the late 1970s, the number of fish taken dropped by 75%. Striped bass travel a thousand miles from New England in the summer down to their wintering grounds off North Carolina. 
getting different states to cooperate has been crucial to protecting the bass. Restricting fishing in New England wouldn't have helped much without protecting spawning grounds in the Chesapeake Bay and Delaware River. Fifteen states formed a partnership to save the striped bass by limiting fishing and studying why its numbers had declined. The striped bass was in jeopardy for several reasons. In the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, where 70% of the species spawn, overfishing depleted the stock. In the Delaware ecosystem, pollution was the problem. Each spring, adult fish swim into tidal estuaries and rivers to spawn. But sewage from cities along the Delaware River created a pollution block. The fish couldn't swim through water depleted of oxygen by the pollution. Government, industry, and private citizens reduce sewage flowing into the river, and now the pollution block is gone. In the Chesapeake, a moratorium on fishing for striped bass in the late 1980s gave the species a chance to recover. Most fishermen cooperated with a temporary ban because they wanted to encourage